to go to any of the participating schools. I went by bail today and dropped off. Um, we had another director at Rockefeller. And, where'd you go? Bell. Bell. Bell also, mm -hmm. that's right. But that was a great, great way to give back uh, some toiletries, non perishable items, all that good stuff where we can provide those resources to those in need. So, no questions at all? All right, Dr. Wright, that's your question. All right. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Every time I say good evening, uh, only here two or three people respond. Good evening. Good, good evening. evening. So before I um, get started, I, I feel so guilty. Um, you know, I've, I've gotten a, a lot of, I hate to use the word praise lately, about this stock the rock the right way and how it was such a um, great idea, perfect timing uh, to be able to make sure that we support um, our, our kids and families uh, since we'll be out for spring break and you know, I feel kind of kind of guilty because it wasn't even my idea. It's, it's her idea. <laughs> but she came up with the name. She came up with the name. <laughs> Pam, uh, I used to joke when I first got here about Pam being my real boss um, because when I first got here she really she really did control um, my schedule and where I went and give me talking points of what to say and what not to say. And so uh, I definitely appreciate um, all that she contributes to our district. Um, and I, I like to give credit where credit is due. And so uh, thank you for coming up with the, the name, the concept, and everything. It was really all fancy, so thank you. Um, also, I see several of our folks here um, in the building. So I do want to take uh, the time to acknowledge um, our employees and um, I love the opportunity to work and serve in the city of Little Rock, and there's no way in the world that I could do what I do without the help and support of several people who are in this room after hours still working. And so uh, if you're a Little Rock School District employee, you raise your hand. Thank you guys for coming out. Uh, Jackie, always here. Um, and Tara, uh, a couple of people who are new uh, with me, and I just want you to know who they are, Mr. Jesse Lee. Um, this is Mr. Lee's third district with me. We started out working together in Birmingham, and he came with me to Mississippi, and uh, now he is here in Little Rock serving, so appreciative of him. And then uh, uh, Melissa Goody, can you raise your hand? Melissa is our chief academic officer, and she is responsible for everything um, related to academics and instruction, and is doing a great job helping us to really refocus our efforts and our energy and our our time um, and our priority on what's most important in our district, and that is teaching and learning. Um, at the end of the day, it's about making sure that when kids leave our school district that they are prepared to do anything that they want to do. Um, and that has to continue to be our priority. Um, I have a few things to talk about, and I probably promise you I'm not going to talk long, and I will pause um, for questions. And I do want to Thank City Director Lewis. And I failed to acknowledge our board member, Ms. Oh, Nikki Hatt. I was getting for a little rock school year. So I am sorry. <laughs> One of my nine bosses. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for all of your support. And, uh, um, Real quick, I'm, I'm real um, excited about where we're going um, as a district and very excited about the opportunity to really join forces uh, with the city of Little Rock. And this today, I think, is just representation of really what we want to see moving forward. You know, we have finite resources in the school district. The city has finite resources um, and with the city of Little Rock, and it does not make any sense for us to try to tackle some of the, the issues um, that we experience in our city doing it separately. And so we are beginning to collaborate more, to talk more, to plan more, uh, to use our resources together so that we can um, accomplish uh, more than what we can accomplish by ourselves. And I can tell you top of mind right now is really um, some of the violent issues that we see um, in our city with young people, the increase in violence that we're seeing in our schools, um, the uh, the increasing mental health and social emotional needs of our, not just our students, our students are representative of, of, of families. Um, and so we've got to really synergize and come together and do what we can to make sure um, that we support our whole, whole entire, our whole entire community. Students, the families, 
um, they're all one unit. And so the, the good thing and also um, the challenging thing about being a public school district is that we have the charge to educate and serve all. We don't have the luxury to pick and choose, and if we had the luxury, I don't think we would take that luxury. Um, we educate and serve anybody who walks through our doors. And unfortunately, because of the times in which we're living, kids are coming to us with more needs than they've ever had, than they've had before. And so we as a district and as a city, we've got to shift um, in how we um, uh, serve um, and try to meet the needs of our students and families um, because they have many more needs, many more complicated needs uh, than, what we, than what we've had to deal with before. And you would probably be surprised, and maybe you won't be surprised, that we're seeing more and more issues with our younger children. Kindergarten, first, second, grade. Like, you would be surprised at the number of, um, a lot of challenges and issues that our, our kids are coming to us with. And, and we have to be in a position to make sure that we um, are equipped to meet their needs. And so I'm excited uh, to, to, to continue these conversations with the city um, and combine our resources uh, so that we can make sure that we're doing the best we can to serve and meet the needs of our community. A couple things I wanted to mention. Um, how many of you are parents? Okay, if, are you, raise your hand if you're the parent of a middle or a high school student. Like how many of you are aware that right now your child can have access to free tutoring, homework help, 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Oh, all right, so we're, we're batting 100%, two out of two. <laughs> That's great. So if you don't know, um, we are partnering with TutorMe, uh, which is a national tutoring organization um, that provides tutoring in any content area um, and also homework assistance in any area in addition to help with writing, even if kids are struggling um, with writing assignments or, or any type of assignments that they're getting for schools, they can uh, dial up, call up, uh, tutor me and be connected with a tutor in a matter of seconds and minutes. And that is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we're trying to make sure that our students have no excuse um, to get in the support uh, and the help that they need. And in our elementary grades, we are piloting um, a couple of uh, tutoring projects with Ignite Reading. You may have heard about Ignite. Uh, they were featured um, in uh, some media coverage a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm forgetting some of the other. Uh, anyway, we have about two or three <laughs> that we are piloting. Learning, learning. Thank you. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. So right now we're piloting about three of these uh, tutoring approaches in a couple of our elementary schools to kind of see which um, approach is having the biggest impact on our students. And then our plan is to scale up. Um, in the fall uh, to make sure that whatever program is working uh, the most effective that we're going to pilot it in more schools and be able to serve more students. And we're already seeing great results um, from our kids who have been working um, with Ignite. I mean, if you haven't uh, seen that story, I don't know how you would, I'm sure it's on our website or our social media, um, but we're seeing kids make tremendous um, gains with that particular program. And I'll just share one little story. And I don't cry a lot. Um, Ms. Hatter, you were there. Several people were there in the room. But we actually had a fifth grader um, during the, the time when the Ignite team was here who was you know, telling us about her experience with the tutoring program. And so this is a, a fifth grade um, young lady who said out of her own mouth, you know, she's always struggled with reading. She hadn't been able to read. And she uttered these words. She said, now I see hope for my future because I am now able to read. And it broke us all down. <laughs> um, and so that's the type of transformational learning experiences we want to see for our students. And so I'm looking forward to being able to offer um, this approach. It's, it's a one-on-one -on -one approach. Our students work with a live virtual tutor for 15 minutes a day, every single day. Um, and it's, it's, it's really paying, paying off. And so we're looking forward to being able to offer that and expand it to more kids in the fall. Uh, community schools, uh, we have six community schools. If you don't keep up with what our community schools are doing, uh, you should. Uh, we have uh, Chico, Stevens, Maplevale Middle, Elementary, and Elementary, help me out. Washington. Washington, how can I forget Watson. Washington? And Watson. 
Um, this was birth uh, through a partnership with the city of Little Rock, and um, we are, you know, meeting so many different needs of kids and families beyond academics. Um, we have health clinics, dental clinics, um, social services, all types of things um, that are happening in in, uh, in in these schools and these communities. And we are so thrilled that we were just awarded a one million dollar grant for the next three years, at least, but potentially more. Um, with communities, communities in Schools, which is a national organization, so we'll be able to even expand and offer more services um, to our students and families. And so um, it's a, an exciting time to be a part of the Little Rock School District. Um, we already know that we have a lot of need, and we're getting the resources that we need to make sure, again, that we're serving our students and our families and our communities. Um, I know this may not be the audience uh, for this, but I'm sure several, several of you know parents of students in our district. We have a huge issue with attendance. It's almost like we hadn't bounced back from uh, the pandemic when we were switching from virtual to in-person and sometimes uh, kids got a little, kids and parents got a little too comfortable with being at home. Um, but we know that kids can't learn if they're not in school. And it is a chronic problem, not just in one school, but in every single school, and it's not just one demographic, it spreads across demographics. Um, we've got to figure out a way uh, to make sure, especially in our younger grades, and we know that you know, the younger kids aren't responsible for getting themselves to school. It's an adult issue, and so we've got to figure out a way to, um, to engage our parents and, and, and put things in place to make sure that they realize the importance of making sure that their kids are in school every single day. But it's a big enough problem for me to talk about everywhere I go because we need folks to spread the word of how important it is for um, our kids to be in school every single day. One last thing, then I'll stop for questions. And so um, later on this year, um, when we get towards the end of the school year, over the summer and the course of the fall, we're going to be um, launching and we're still playing around with, with words. but. Uh, reimagining LRSD campaign, which will kind of be more of a grassroots approach um, to try to connect with every facet and every phase of our community um, just to get folks involved and engaged to know what we're doing, um, not just to know what we're doing, the main purpose is to, to get feedback from our community, every facet of our community. We want to know what do people want to see us do as a district? What are some programs that you want to see us offer that we're not offering? Or what are some things that um, uh, you want to see in our district that you don't see? There's a lot of noise and ruckus happening in our state and community with regards to um, education and the Learns Act, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about. Um, but I'm looking at it from a different perspective. I see this as an opportunity for us as a community, as a city, and as a district to take some steps back and to take this opportunity to redefine and to reimagine how we do school. Um, too many times we've looked at school only happening in Monday through Friday from eight to three, and we've been stuck on this antiquated model for a long time. We know that we have kids who have various types of needs, various types of interests, um, and I think now is the time for us to think about how can we better meet the needs of all of our kids, and it doesn't have to be in this strict Monday through Friday, eight to three um, sort of way. We know that um, you know, certain aspects of our community uh, is hurting. Large numbers of our kids are hurting. They don't always know how to express uh, some of the hurt um, and pain that they've experienced, and they lash out and show it in different ways. Um, and sometimes a traditional Monday through Friday, eight to three type of structure doesn't work for every single kid. And so we've got to think differently about how um, we provide education. Um, and so. I, I really think this is the opportune time for us as a community to take advantage of um, some of the craziness that is going on, <laughs> uh, to think about how the Little Rock school, school District can shift and reimagine itself so that we can position ourselves to better meet the needs of our kids and show everyone in the state um, that our kids have just as much potential as everyone um, and that we are well equipped um, and prepared uh, to meet, meet the challenges um, that our kids and our communities uh, that they face. And so I will stop talking um, and we'll entertain any uh, questions or comments from anyone in the audience, everyone except 
Dr. Whitfield. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Wright, I just wanted to ask you as far as community is concerned or student attendance, um, have you found like um, grade level or um, even maybe regional or area? Is, is there any, are there any indicators that you found so far as to why this is happening so, um, so frequently? So the first part of your question was, have we noticed any trends in like a particular grade level? No, it is it's across the board, every grade level, every school, every demographic area. Um, reasons I really think, you know, and I don't have a way to, to know if this is true or not, but I think people got so comfortable with, with being able to flex from in person to virtual and having all those options that you hear, you even hear parents say today, well, you know, I'm not gonna worry about sending a job to school, they can just go virtual. And we don't even have a virtual option in some cases. And parents will say, well, you know, they're not gonna come this week just because, you know, whatever, we'll just let them go virtual. Mm -hmm. um, people really haven't gotten out of that mindset. I know we have, um, I won't put anybody on the spot, um, but I know we have one of our assistant principals in the room. Um, so if she would like to offer anything that she sees, uh, <laughs> feel free to speak up. Not calling any names, Ms. Wright. <laughs> um, it is, like you said, it's across, since I'm in a K-8 campus, um, I do the truancy letters and with my principal, and it is across all grades. And it, we were actually having a conversation after school today. Uh, we've had students, and I think we've been working with um, student registration as well, because we've had to drop students. We, they just don't show up anymore, and we, we're trying to figure out why. We go through all of the steps. That Dr. Fields has lined out. We send out the letters. We do the phone calls. Um, you know, we talked to one parent today, and it was just kind of like we're it's you know they haven't been feeling well, or we they've got other things going on, and it's we've got to get back, like you said, to we're not in a pandemic anymore. We are going back to having school in the classroom, uh, and so that needs to be advertised. And I'm thinking about um, Dr. McCarroll did a big push several years ago with Feet to the Seat. And um, I know when, and maybe we need to bring something like that back with incentivizing and, and making, you know, getting that uh, communication back out to our community about the importance of school. There is no virtual option anymore. We're not gonna go virtual. And I, I think that that might be the direction we need to go is going back to like before COVID, we did those campaigns about getting out there, getting the community and saying, this is why your child needs to be in school. And I I appreciate that so much. I yes. want to share that I have a mother who uh, worked in social work. Yes. And the Little Rock School District years ago had uh, social workers going into homes when mm -hmm. things like that were happening mm -hmm. to find out um, what's going on in the household. How can we be supportive? And so I want to offer that we've had programs in the past that mm -hmm. have been successful mm -hmm. in working as it relates to truancy. Um, but I also wanted to ask a, another question about the Little Rock School District as far as um, just ways to invite uh, people to know uh, that the district is a, a not only a safe place to come, but it's a healthy place for you to, to go and grow, right? And so what ways are we promoting yep. that? So that's that's actual, another component of the, the reimagined LRSD campaign that I'm talking about. And so, um, you know, I was having a conversation today with some folks just trying to think of, um, a catchphrase or slogan or something to kind of uh, uh, align with exactly what you're talking about. And so one of the things we talked about when we launched this campaign is to talk about like all the different Little Rock School District. And you know, I've been a lot of different places. And so Little Rock School District, we are not, we're not a broke district. Um, we are a district full of resources. Um, we have lots of different programming. We have lots of great things going on. We do not do a good job of highlighting that and selling it and making sure people know. And so, you know, I forgot the phrase that um, a gentleman said today, but he was basically saying, if you want to do robotics, we got that here, or, you know, whatever. And so um, that's actually, um, we're, we're going to be working with a um, communications marketing team to kind of help us um, figure out how to, how, to, how to message that. And so that will be a part of the campaign that we're talking about, too. We have a, you know, and I'm, I'm not just, I'm not going to sell something that I don't believe in. And while we have our challenges as, as a district, we have so many great things happening every single day um, that just don't make the news. Um, and again, we 
have not been um, effective in telling our, telling our story in a consistent way, uh, in a way that it will land throughout the community. And so that's part of what this campaign will, will focus on. Yes, sir, and I'm, sorry, I'm saying yes, sir, and <laughs> yes, ma'am, and then yes. But, uh, I'm a former employee of the Water District. Um, a few things that I'd like to mention. I know each last, well, I guess prior to the COVID, uh, when I was there, there was always a concentration on mental health in reference to the students, but now basically in reference to the staff, and I think sometimes the staff members needed a uh, safe haven where they could either talk with someone or, you know, get that so that they could really continue to handle the things that they need in their classroom and, and really work. The other part is the attendance. If children are allowed to be out of school when they're very young, it's harder for them to even come when they become older. Now, I worked in the alternative education program that was at Metro, the APC program, when it first started. And of course, that was the main issue why kids were there, because they were absent from the classroom. Not that they didn't have the ability to do the work. And of course, uh, my job at one time was to go to the homes to find out what was what and all that good things. And then, of course, um, I think a lot a lot of times, some of the high schools really want to just put the kids in an alternative ed uh, program because it slacks down their attendance after. But they lowered the number of credits that the kids had to have in order to go to those alternative programs. And that wasn't good because anybody could just go pretty much now. Uh, you know, they could just go. So. Alternatively, it was not really meant, meant for kids to stay there for a lifetime until they got 21. So if that doesn't give them an, uh, something to really work for if they could just go, you know. So those are the things that I think would be something that, if that was changed, would really be a good uh, thing for the district. Yes, and the district does not promote some of the other good things that are taking place. Basically, what we see is that the students who are excelling in school, we see that. Then kids who are playing ball, we see that. But then there are other kids who are really doing some good things. Mm -hmm. They won't be the honor students, mm -hmm. or they won't be the ones who are playing, you know, the sports and things, but they are excelling. And they are people that we see and give credit to the Little School District. Ditto. Amen. Absolutely right. I don't know how many of you are um, following uh, some of the discussions we've been having um, regarding our tiered support plan um, and some of the structural changes we're making in the district to kind of address some of those things that you just talked about. And so for a long time, we've only talked about the social emotional needs and the mental health needs of students. Um, and we brought back into the conversation that You've got to have healthy adults um, in our district, and we have to have a culture and an environment that is healthy so that our adults will be able to effectively deal with the kids and their issues. You can't have adults setting kids off because we haven't learned how to deal with our, <laughs> our own issues because that only makes matters worse. And so that's a part of our, our, our tiered plan of support of an adult staff wellness piece, and you really don't see that prioritized in a lot of K-12 systems. Um, but we realize that that's a dire need um, in the Little Rock School District, and so, it, and again, it's not just a, a person, it's just not a person in a position, it's how do we make staff well-being and making sure that we have a healthy culture in every building in our campus, how do we like intertwine that in all the work that we do, and so in all of our professional learning trainings and um, how do we make sure that our leaders who are leading departments and leading schools are keeping that in the forefront of how they lead and how they, uh, how they approach the work so that we can have a healthy environment and a healthy culture with healthy adults who are prepared to help kids with issues. I'm sorry. Uh, right here and then. So are you, can you break down two terms I heard recently as board in 
PTL and pathways as it pertains to magnet schools and perhaps changing that curriculum? Yes, <laughs> I'll, 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 yes I can. So I really want us to, to kind of divorce ourselves from Ford NGL. Ford NGL is just a framework, um, it is just a term, um, and sometimes I think we've gotten hung up on this term and we haven't looked at the, the bigger picture. All this, so when we talk about academies, academies back in the day were just a way to redesign high schools to make pathways that what align with interests of kids. So it's just a way to like um, get kids interested in school, uh, give them a reason to come. If they are taking courses or they select a pathway that is of something that's of personal interest to them, then the concept and belief is that they will be more apt to um, be more engaged in school. They'll come um, because they have an opportunity to explore things and to learn about things that are of personal interest to them. So it doesn't take away from you know, the core curriculum, graduation requirements, all those things are in place. But kids will also have an opportunity to select a pathway that is of personal interest to them. Um, and it's not just about, you know, we hear this term workforce development. That is, can be a component, but it is not solely just to develop kids for the workforce. There are um, high skill types of pathways, um, that kids have to go to college to complete. Um, there are also pathways that are designed for kids who may not want to go to college, but yet they can still leave school with um, the, per the preparation and the skills to still get a high wage job. Um, and so it's designed again to meet the needs of a, wi a wide variety of kids. So is that looking to place, for lack of better words, the magnet program that is happening? So, no. Both can coexist. Yeah, right, right. And I think the only place where um, that's happening now or developing to happen now is, is at Parkview. Right. Yeah. But they can coexist. This is all oh, sorry. Hey, okay. hey. Are you bracing? What do the Rock School District do doing to brace for the learn? and the loss of students. Now, are we going to keep on building buildings, or are we going to cap that off and try to maintain and anticipate a loss of students to private or charter or church schools? We have a lot of, a lot of work in here. Uh, how, how are you going to address that? Well, I think the first thing for me is, uh, I'm going to just speak personally, I've had to uh, really divorce myself <laughs> from all of the craziness and chatter that was going on for, for a while. Um, and I'll tell you the message that I've been telling you that over. Um, regardless of what happens with the Learns Act, uh, we know they're in the beginning of the, the rule making phase now. Um, and that's really, you know, the devil is always in the details. And although the law has been passed, you know, there's still a lot of ambiguity and lack of clarity uh, about how certain things are going to be implemented. So while, um, and I do encourage everybody in this room to please um, get involved. There's a, uh, a link out now. We probably need to put this up on our website and, and share it on social media for anybody who wants to be a part of the um, working groups that are working on the rulemaking process for all of the different components uh, of the learners that we, we'll start sharing that out. We need to get people involved because this is where, um, to me, this is like the most important part uh, of the process. But to answer your question, what I've been telling staff is two things. First thing is, I, I don't think anybody can forecast how many students we will lose. What we can say is, there will always be students in the Little Rock School District. Always. And I think it's safe to say, or safe to predict, that the percentage of kids in our school district that will come to us with more needs and need, needing more support will probably increase. And so our mission needs to still be the same. We haven't figured out a way just yet to make sure that all of our kids, regardless of what challenges they have,
if they bring are able to lead our system successfully. And so we still got to focus on the main thing, which is making sure that we're serving kids well. Um, that's never going to change, regardless of how many kids that we lose. Um, so that's number one. Number two, in terms of the, the building of schools, um, I know that we are in the process of opening Lacey in fall of 24. Um, and so I know Cloverdale and Baseline, Baseline um, will close, and that will populate, um, serve as the basis of population for Lacey K. I know that we are already in the planning stages for building a high school out west. Um, I, I cannot predict what actions we will take in the future, but I don't see us building any more schools. I, um, I don't see us building any more schools. Yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't see there, I don't see that there will be um, a need. What I, I don't know if you were in here when I was talking about really figuring out how to do school differently um, and not stick to this same model that we've been doing forever. And so I think we have an opportunity to use some of our buildings who may be underpopulated differently than we've used in the past. I do see that happening, um, but I don't see us building any new schools. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to make an observation. Um, I think the school district should promote public education more. I don't think we do a good job of that. And secondly, I used to work at juvenile court for truancy and things family legal services. So I'm quite familiar with the truancy uh, issue that's happening now and was happening 15 years ago, but now it's gotten worse. But So my suggestion is that if we could find a way to reach out to those parents to emphasize the importance of education, because that's the real issue. Any parent will send their child to school if they understand the importance of education, but if they don't see that, they don't see a need to send them. And so we need to really work on, and that's what we did in, in FINS, as, as you know, uh, Family and Legal Services, mm -hmm. is reach out to the parents, because they're the ones that are responsible for those same little ones that you were speaking of in terms that we're having problems with right now. And I can give you an example of two weeks ago, I was in the dollar store and I saw this little child in the aisle. And I asked him, I said, hi, how are you doing? I said, um, what are you doing here? I said, why are you not at school? He told me where he went to school. He said, because I had to get my hair done today. Mm -hmm. Now that was more important to the parent than him being in school, and this was a Wednesday at one o'clock. So you see what we're dealing with. So this we've got a, to find a way to reach yeah. out to those parents. This may be a popular um, position. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with you. I think we need to do that. Yes. I also think, you know, I, I've been trying to learn a lot more about the truancy process here. And what, I've, what I'm discovering and what I'm learning, um, you know, there's a backlog, maybe not enough people to really process things. And then the way in which parents are held accountable here feels and looks completely different than, like, when I was a principal in D.C., we had fake truancy letters <laughs> that if you showed up to a parent's house on one of these letters, um, it caused enough uh, fear, and maybe fear is not the right approach, but it caused enough, um, it, 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 it did something to make sure mm -hmm. that they got kids back in school. And in some cases, it was connected to sometimes benefits that they will, they will receive. Mm -hmm. um, and so the more I'm learning about you know, some of the gaps in our truancy, um, I don't know the right word, processes or, and I'm not one who believes in over penalizing folks, but especially for little kids, elementary age kids, it's the adults. Our attendance problem is an adult issue. It's not an, it's not an issue with kids. And so um, one of the things we've been working with um, Dana and some other folks at the city of Little Rock is um, to really trying to figure out ways to kind of close some loops and some holes um, in the truancy process to make sure that the process has some teeth. Because right now it doesn't. You know, we're following. You know, the the we have a process in our district that we follow. But once we get to that third step, it's we're really oh, dependent upon right. somebody else to yeah. pick something up, and yeah. there's nobody picking. Well, <laughs> prosecutor, <laughs> nobody picking. Yes. city attorney, yeah. to prosecute. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, yeah. we, we only have two 
two juvenile court judges who used to have three. And so that has caused a problem. I don't even talk about doing things before it gets mm -hmm. to, to, to that, because I don't want to, you know. But we've got to have some, some more teeth in our, in our truancy processes to, to make some of our adults respond better than what well, they respond to. The county to judge did away with family needed services. So that was one issue because you had people who were buffering mm -hmm. before they get to that stage. Now you have probation officers handling truancy cases when they shouldn't be doing that. And a lot of because it's they're just, not yeah. and it's <laughs> adjudicated as being, you know, needing probation. So why are you doing that? Yeah. Well, it's a backlog. They don't have enough people. But they never hire enough people to handle those type of issues. And the key kind of comes back to not penalizing, mm -hmm. but having something that's attractive enough that people don't want that their too. kids to miss school. Yes, 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 yes. Right. Yes, yes, yes. right. Yeah. And I think that that I think that has more weight middle and high school, but again, a kindergarten, a first grade, a second grader, like, they don't know. They, they just, you know. I meant, I meant yeah. from the parent perspective. Oh, yes, yes, right. yes. Because yes. The, the middle school, of course, the middle school and high school students, they're going to beg their parents to get them there. Mm -hmm. But from a parent perspective, if they see a benefit of their child going to school, if they see the benefit, mm -hmm. you know, why horses couldn't get them or beat them from getting yes. their kids, yeah. right? So I think that that's the onus is on us as a little yeah, school district and little school district leaders to do that so that they can have no reason not to have them in school district. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yes, it's forms on the table. Please fill out um, this questions for Little Rock School District if you did not get them answered today and we will answer them and get back with you. And you have some too. This one looks as just as it is. Yeah, but you gotta say it's some seating ones out there for me. So please, I asked y'all if you didn't want to answer your questions. For, for the fancy folks, there's a QR code on it too, so you don't even have to fill And the QR code, you can fill it out online. So you want to turn them in? Sorry? Do you want to turn them in or ask them now? Either, you can Either or. Um, uh -huh, or ask. Yeah. So, Aunt, um, I wanted to ask Director Lewis. Um, so, I know that you're new in your position, but um, like, has the city, as far as you understood or understand it, made a commitment beyond? I know that the community schools is something that the city is doing, but what ways? Of, is the city of Little Rock willing to help the Little Rock School District um, not only maintain its current population and enrollment, but to also help the Little Rock School District not lose any more of our students? How, how is the city of Little Rock committed to making sure that our public school system um, is not harmed by the attacks on public schools? The best way I can answer that, honestly, and full transparency, is being the best advocate for the Little Rock School District. And that's all of the city officials where we're standing behind the district. Yes, we have funds going towards community schools in different um, parts of the district, but I feel like we are the best representation. If we can be that voice and that advocate and promote all the positivity and the advantages of why you should have your child in public school and that to me carries a lot of weight on keeping them engaged and enrolled in the LRSD. I hope that gives any, enough. Yeah, I, and, I, and I guess I'm wanting to know if there are any new specific investments that the city is willing to make on behalf of the Little White School District because there, there are some new laws that are coming in play that are specifically attacking public schools. At this time, I don't have an answer for that. I don't, and I'm just being honest. So I don't want to be premature, and I'm kind of <laughs> hesitant about um, sharing certain things, but I can tell you, and I forgot the name of the department, the, the what's the name? The, the, yes, is it community? The, 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 yeah, yes. So they have access to um, a budget. They have been 
you know, giving grants to various um, community organizations to provide some things. And so some of those things may continue, but we're also looking, we're also trying to explore, you know, like out of school suspension centers to keep kids from being suspended, having them regionally placed in various parts of the city um, where those out of school suspension centers could be staffed with um, social workers or, I don't know if people even know this, but the city has not only, the city has funded one or two, in some cases two social workers at every one of our community school sites who do a lot of the outreach uh, that you guys have mentioned before. It's just isolated to those six schools right now. Um, but we're, I don't want to share too much because it's just, it's just, it's conversation and planning right now. Um, but we are having real, real conversations about needs and, like I said, synergizing the resources that the city has with things that we have so that we can work in concert instead of us trying to, you know, address an issue with what we have and they trying to address the issues with what they have and, and we're trying to try to work together. So those things are happening. Dr. Wright, can I ask that as you're having those conversations that you would um, lend focus to some of the buildings in the Little Rock School District that might be considered underutilized so that we do not lose those schools to charter schools? And I can tell you we are. Uh, okay. Yep. Good question. At, uh, Senate Bill 71, that affirmative action bill, how did that play with some of your funding as far as now, it's going to be a if 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 if, uh, if you accept if Arkansas accepts that that bill, then how does that go in contrast with uh, the federal? <coughs> Hasn't that bill died? I thought it because I read something yesterday or t that it, it's not even it's it's it's, it's dying or that <coughs> because I I know how the system works. It may die right now, it might be a short-lived death and, and brought back up. So this is his second death. Is that what we're saying? going to be an additional um, early childhood site um, in the district. So, yeah. And that's, you know. And who? Guyer's Guyer. Yeah. Yeah. But, and I don't, need, I don't know, like, many of you probably know better than I know, but when I, sad to say, but the early childhood centers are like one of the last uh, set of schools that I actually went to go visit in Romine was like the last one maybe like last month, um, we ought to be promoting our early childhood programs like crazy because it is probably, it's one of the best things that we have going. Um, I mean, it's really high quality. I mean, really high quality. Um, I don't know if, if you, I don't know if you pay attention, I don't know if how many of you follow me on Twitter, but um, I was so blown away by a four-year-old reading, like, at Roman reading like a, a chapter book. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that's going back to what, what we don't promote well <laughs> um, is our early childhood programs because they're really, really top tier. To ask the uh, city director's question about ways that the city can actually help us, um, and there are other people in the room uh, who help to formulate this question, but looking at zoning so that we can protect the Little Rock School District as well, um, because we know, again, there's this encroachment that can happen uh, by the state, so the city can be proactive by setting some zoning policies um, in place. So I just, we just want to offer that. Zone. That's a great point. Door prizes. 
Everyone have a red ticket? Thank you all for your participation this evening. We tried to sweeten the pot a little bit uh, by soliciting some door prizes. And this one is particularly interesting to me. It's from Eggshells, one of our partners. It has seaside caramel chocolate chicken and waffles and pigs and taters. Okay. So this will be our grand prize. Uh, number one two nine nine eight two seven. Eight two seven. Yep. Oh, so nice. <laughs> Enjoy lunch at Chick Fil A. Compliments of our early our, our Title One program. Um, Miss Contera, do you mind taking a picture? to us, but it's to Longhorn Steakhouse, and I felt like you probably need to have two of them to get a steak dinner, <laughs> or something close to that. So uh, we are going to give you two $10 gift cards, this lucky person. And the winner is 129-9836. <laughs> and our final prize for the evening, you can tell us how this chicken and waffles chocolate bar tastes. Chicken and waffle chocolate bar. And this is compliments of eggshell. Pig, pigs and taters, chicken and waffles, and seaside caramel and some What's that? Salsa? Salsa. salsa and some other yummy stuff in there. Um, oh, it's Wicked Mix. Oh, okay. So, one, two, nine, nine, eight, two, five.